Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cloud Security Alliance's FinCloud Summit. We have a great panel today to talk about best practices operating financial services workloads up in public cloud. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Sean Gray. I'm Managing Director and Global Head of Cybersecurity for Payments at JP Morgan. Hi, I'm David Cross. I'm the uh, Senior Vice President and CISO for the Oracle SaaS Cloud. Joanna Mendez de Franca from Sun Life. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Cloud Computing and DevOps. Hi all, uh, I'm Jesus Fidalgo. Uh, I work at Block Inc, uh, the parent company for Square and Cash App, and I am focused mainly on uh, regulatory compliance. Wonderful, thanks all. Uh, David, you want to get us started with a couple, couple tone setting comments? Yeah, absolutely. And certainly, uh, I kind of brought it up a little bit at the uh, RSA conference last year as well. But really, it's not a question if if you are moving to the cloud, it's a question of when you are moving the cloud. And the reality is, like you know, I think Gartner said uh, in you know by 2028, right, is that 70% of all workloads are going to run in a cloud computing environment. So it's really, I think, this is a great conversation today. Agreed. And uh, by the way, to kind of get the dialogue started, um, you know, looking at looking at the the organizational level, um, how how do you think we decide which workloads? Uh, make sense for deployment uh, into public cloud. Uh, Jesus, you want to start us off? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this this is something that I think about a lot, um, and and it's an important factor to consider, especially in highly regulated industry of financial services that we are in and that we're talking about today. Um, you know, focusing on the regulatory compliance piece, uh, thinking about um, the the data that is being migrated to cloud environments, having a focus with maybe the less uh, sensitive workloads that organizations have, moving those to the cloud first. And then as the organization feels a little bit more comfortable with uh, deploying systems and managing systems within cloud environments, then they can start looking into deploying some of those uh, more difficult and highly sensitive workloads, uh, also ensuring that the cloud providers also have the appropriate regulatory compliance certifications in order to, to move those workloads. Um, uh, but, but David, I'd love to hear what, what, what you think here. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, kind of building upon that, I think you're hitting on the, the most important point, right? Is although we think everything will move at some point, is to think any given organization or business needs to look at there are specific needs, there are specific requirements, you know, and what let's think globally here is that looking at the cloud providers or application providers that have the audits, the certifications, the pen test reports that you need to meet your needs. And that's how what can really help you make the best decisions on when and who you actually may move to. It's a great point. Um, if I could add, just from an internal perspective, um, at Sun Life, we've we've gone to establishing a couple of different frameworks to make it simple for our um, application developers or builders to decide. So we've got a cloud suitability framework that allows them to quickly assess um, the, num the number of factors in regards to like the application performance, the ac access requirements or data transit requirements, things like that. And then we also leverage a um, well-architected framework, which is a best practice that has a number of pillars. Um, you know, it talks about operational excellence, reliability, performance, efficiency, and of course, security. Um, and the security pillar focuses on, you know, um, you know, Jesus, you mentioned from a data standpoint, protecting the information in the systems um, that cover confidential confidentiality or integrity of the data, um, managing user permissions, things like that. So making it simple for our um, our community of builders to assess which workloads should actually move. Taking that, I, I love those ideas. I think one of the other pieces that I've seen uh, companies sometimes miss on a little bit is uh, understanding sort of the upstream and downstream dependencies that go along uh, with a workload. So you think we're just gonna move this microservice, this particular application, this, this thing up to cloud, <clears throat> and that thing might be cr critically dependent on a backend data store that's latency sensitive. And so understanding what those, what those other side impacts can look like might legitimately change how you prioritize workloads in addition to just you know the regulatory oversight standpoint, um, whatever frameworks you build, but just understanding sort of the, within the health of your own ecosystem, what performance means to you um, and how to mitigate and, and minimize impacts uh, at time of migration and, and particularly test. Um, moving on from there, so cloud brings a lot of cloud brings along a, a lot of interesting challenges and also opportunities. Uh, what do we think about what an organization can do to just sort of continuously maintain a strong security posture? Uh, David, you want to start us there? Sure. You know, Sean, 
I, you know, it's at first I'm going to say it's going to sound like a broken record, but you know, I'm going to really say there's three things, right? First and foremost, MFA, MFA, MFA. You have to have mandatory, mandatory MFA all the time, no exceptions, right? Because all the attacks, 95% of the time, they always come from someone's not using MFA and they're fished. The second thing is, you know, looking at your identity provider, the roles and the access of your users, right? You always need to be monitoring those things is that users come and go, roles change, right? And how you're pulling down your application logs. When you move to the cloud, you have to pull down these logs, right? They're not necessarily provided to you, you know, de facto or automatically. And then the third item is really the application. Your application's in the, in the cloud, but you still own the application. You still own the users. You still own the logs for those applications. And you need to be bringing those down and monitoring those. And that is how you can maintain the posture. Because if you have an incident or activity and you don't do those three things, it's already too late. It's, I, I think I, I love the MFA, MFA, MFA uh, position, David. It, it makes a ton of sense. Um, it, it's key for, for us at Sun Life as well. And one of the things we've done is adopt a multi-account um, a multi-account strategy framework. So again, a best practice model um, It's designed to meet your security needs. It, it gives you the ability to scale and adapt your environment depending on the business needs. Um, and it has things like centrally de developed and executed guardrails, um, security monitoring to your point and governance integration with, with using enterprise level tools. Um, identity and access management um, to your point is key um, and within that one account rather than having a shared account model where you've got a multitude of people that are accessing into there and then a centralized network management approach um, with your gateways and VPCs, firewalls, load balancers, things like that. So um, Jesus would love to hear kind of how you're approaching it. Yeah, absolutely. To add on to all those great points that have been made, uh, one of the things that I think is critical to focus on is data security posture. Um, as organizations start to move all of this critical and sensitive data to cloud environments, one of the things that could occur is data sprawl, right? We can have data in many different places in the environments and it's very difficult to manage. So having uh, great tools that can scan all of the data sources in the cloud and if they're still on-prem environments, scanning those data sources as well to determine if, if we're protecting this data as we're supposed to. Um, especially from a regulatory compliance standpoint, uh, there are very specific requirements for organizations and financial services industry on how we're supposed to protect this data. Um, uh, some of the tools out there do a very good job at, at detecting this data and determining if it's uh, protected in the right way. So continuing to scan this data and having good processes around uh, responding to whenever uh, data is found to not be protected in the way that meets regulatory obligations it, it is one of the things that, that I feel could help really maintain that ongoing strong data security posture. Agreed. And I think, again, all, all great points. I think from my standpoint, um, I usually like to just start simple. You can't defend an ecosystem if you don't see what's going on inside that ecosystem. So from my standpoint, that just establishing visibility and, and insight into what are the moving pieces? What are the services that are being stood up and under what context and in what situations? Where are deployments being managed to, not just in a multi-AZ, but regionally, if you've got multi-regional deployments, like what's happening in all these places? How are data flows happening across VPC, across different data store to application flows and under what context and what, is the, what are the protection mechanisms wrapped around those things? Having insight into the environment and what all the different moving pieces are and what they look like Again, for me, is sort of like the, that fundamental first piece. If you want to protect an ecosystem, you, you kind of got to know and be able to see what's going on inside of it uh, so you can take the appropriate steps. Um, with that, kind of with that springboarding off, how do we, you know, what do we think about finding the right balance between speed of delivery, which is obviously one of the, the primary goals in moving to cloud, um, with the risks associated with moving to, to cloud? So we, we've sort of taken a three-pronged approach to this. The first is we established a cloud enablement model and defined some simple principles for the organization to follow. So upholding stability and security, number one principle, um, ensuring there's no reputational impact or risk to our organization, um, and continuously evolving our operating model as we mature the platform. It's not static. It has to keep moving as, as you mature your platform. And then we try to leverage the skills across our organization um, where they exist in cross-functional squads. Um, second to that is we have established a cloud center of excellence and it supports our cloud ecosystem, which is global. So um, with our 
platform and infrastructure pipeline, um, service enablement, control policies, automation, regional enablement, things like that are central to the platform. Um, and then consumption is regional by our consumers. And lastly, um, automation is key. So embedding a DevOps engineering mindset in all the cloud services that we operationalize, as well as any workload design um, is key. And that allows you to build self-service capabilities into your organization so that your application teams can build and deploy services or workloads. But by providing the controls and the integration of the governance, you um, are, are not are able to do that without sacrificing agility and autonomy for your for your global users. You know, Joanna, I'd love to you know kind of build off your your point about uh, you know DevSecOps. The one I always think about is everybody is you're moving to the cloud with speed, right? You need to have a staging and testing environment, right? Is that you never know when things are going to change, and so you validating things, you know, before you go into full production, you, before it's going live, those type of things. But most importantly, you know, as a security professional. I always have to be the broken record again saying your dev and testing and staging environments need to have the same security controls as your production environment. You have to have MFA in your production in, in your staging environment. You have to have, you know, data masking. You have to have the patching and all the same controls because the moment you do not, that is always going to be your biggest attack vector. So Sean, I'd love to hear your thoughts in this particular area. David, I actually love that. I love the, you know, the concept of, of maintaining parity across the different environments, right? There's, there's the classic problem statement of, you know, I deployed this into production and it doesn't work, but it worked on my laptop. So what gives? Um, and ensuring that that kind of consistency, what are the applications going to do? What are the interactions with backend data stores going to do? Like all these things, like the security paradigm that we build around these environments is is non-trivial, right? Like there's, there's a lot of stuff that you do to, to harden environments. So ensuring that there's sort of a consistent behavioral pattern. When you're running tests, you expect certain outcomes and those outcomes should manifest if you've got parity across the environments. And I think from a, just from a, a speed of delivery standpoint, it helps because you're not chasing ephemeral bugs that are that, that manifest just because there's deltas across environments. Um, the other though is, you know, kind of looking at the nature of the workload itself. Um, is there risk you know, speed always introduce risk, right? Because the faster you go, the more likely you are likely you are to introduce error, especially if there's human invention and intervention involved in a lot of this stuff. Um, but looking at it's kind of taking a step back, looking at the workloads and and asking what's the what is the pressing timeline? What a, why is this time sensitive, and to what degree is it time sensitive? And if we're accelerating this over other workloads, what are the opportunity costs that we kind of need to bake into? the scenario overall to, to make sure we're landing our environments in the right state with the right level of stability, resiliency, performance. Um, so the security ecosystem maintaining consistency of that, I could not agree more. I think it's absolutely critical. And then balancing that against how do we manage the risks that go along with speed of delivery against other workloads that might take better precedence and might be more logical. Um, and again, you know, bringing back to, to something I said earlier, um, it might be that you think you're only moving this one workload and there's some urgency around it, but it's got this critical dependency on a big old backend data store that's latency sensitive. So all of a sudden your migration path went from one workload to potentially a workload plus backend data stores where you need to worry about data at rest, data in transit. So having that, that sort of um, high level view around why we're moving particular workloads up to public cloud, what are the gains? What are the problems that we're looking to solve? Um, and then again, to your point, making sure we're doing it in in a consistent way, so the behaviors are predictable, and and we're sort of landing in the right in the right place from a from a testing and outcome and deployment into production standpoint. Yeah, Sean, uh, I, I love this this focus on the workload itself, right? Because a lot of organizations still have very brittle workloads in, in their environments, and and. While looking at this from the acceptable risk, while trying to move quickly, um, taking a look at those brittle workloads might be an area where speed of delivery might make sense and could be an acceptable risk to take. Uh, because if you have these workloads that are brittle and are really hard to manage in an on-prem environment and you want to migrate that quickly to the cloud, it, it might make sense, uh, of course, always uh, conducting in-depth risk assessments to understand what does it entail to move this workload to the cloud? Is the cloud provider solutions that much better? Is it going to 
take this service that is brittle and make it something that is more robust and reliable for the organization. So focusing on the workload, I think it's a, it's a great way to look at balancing uh, that, that speed with the risk that comes with moving quickly. Agreed, agreed. So with that in mind, you know, what is an area of focus that we feel um, that cloud migration is gonna look like from an evolution standpoint over time based on industry learnings and practices and sort of like, you know, part of moving quickly into cloud is, you know, if you're gonna break things and you're gonna learn and you're gonna tune and, and alter course accordingly. And as the maturity level around these programs evolves, like what are the things that we think um, will evolve in lockstep from a practice standpoint? Uh, Jesus? Yeah, so one of the things that that is really quite different in the cloud over um, being in on-prem environments is the way network segmentation works. It, in traditional environments, uh, most services were deployed on a server and these servers had very traditional networking models, either through firewalls that are deployed in the data center or looking at host-based firewalls on each individual server and, and segmenting things in VLANs and zones. Uh, th this type of segmentation looks quite different in the cloud, especially when you're looking at cloud native services. A lot of these cloud native services in the cloud don't have that traditional network model that we are all used to, right? Uh, while some services do have things like security groups or, or ways to control access at the workload level, some of the native uh, services only have ways to restrict through identity, right? So the way you segment in, in the cloud looks quite different than it has in, in data center environments. And this is something, you know, going back to the regulatory compliance, this is something that has lagged behind, right? In, in the regulatory landscape, uh, it, it, it's an area where regulation has not really kept up with the way that segmentation has evolved. Um, Though I, I will say that there are organizations that are making strides in making sure that uh, their regulation does take modern network architecture segmentation into account, such as uh, the PCI SSC has really looked into this through some of their special interest groups and is currently working on developing a guidance doc to to give organizations the guidance that they need to do network segmentation in the right way within cloud environments and modern network architectures. I love that point. It's one of the, one of the things that I, I agree, I think is super important, right? Like identity is foundational, whether you're talking about user identity, client or customer identity, application identity, service identity, that's sort of the, the fundamental underpinning. Um, I think one of the other things that, that we'll see evolve a little bit, and we're already starting to see this is, the the methodologies that companies are taking to get to cloud and the classic like there's you know lift and shift versus what it might probably my favorite phrase is lift and tinker um where you're kind of tuning on the fly and tweaking post post move versus building something cloud native taking the time to look at the nature of, of the workload the application the service and just modernizing replatforming rebuilding from from the ground up i think we'll see a lot of companies kind of figure out based on learnings and you know, potential missteps and, and issues with with what will work better for them. And I, I I don't get a really clear sense that it's going to be a perfect answer just across the board. Obviously, it's going to be based on workload, the nature of the company, the nature of the risks you're you're dealing with, just based on the your business model. Um, but I think just from what I've seen, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of easy errors to make if you're adopting a, a pure lift and shift approach to, to moving to cloud. Um, lift and tinker is a little bit more like you can kind of nuance your way through it. Uh, but just from a, you know, tried and true, if you can have the opportunity and the time, you know, and really time is a luxury in a lot of these cases to just take that step back, refactor, modernize and build something towards a cloud type of environment. It makes life a little bit, well, a lot of bit easier in a lot of cases. Um, but I think ultimately part of, part of the journey is also baking in the right kind of for lack of a better way to say it, kind of the dwell time. And then when you look at a moving to public cloud, figuring out, okay, if I'm going to do a lift and shift approach, it sounds easy and it sounds fast, but if you move quickly, it's really easy to, to break stuff. And so taking the time ahead of time to methodically plan, 
test, validate your assumptions, bring in extra sets of eyes, make sure you're not missing things. Like there's a lot of factors that go into that. And so if you spend that time ahead of time, you're not spending that time afterwards, chasing bugs, chasing problems, chasing incidents, but balancing that against the dwell time of taking that step back and replatforming, remodernizing, refactoring code from the ground up can be equally or more expensive depending again on the workload. So I think there's a lot more just intelligence that we're going to start to see around like how we, how we think about getting to cloud, what that path looks like um, and how to do it in as, in as, you know, aggressive from a time standpoint perspective, but as, judiciously and safely to maintain the integrity of the business standpoint as we possibly can. I think that's a, I think that's a great point. Um, and I, I think what a lot of organizations, I, I, to your point around like the learnings that you're going to gain um, through time. And I think what maybe we're going to see organizations do is try to run a little bit of that in parallel. So whether you're thinking about um, how to refactor your applications, but also then how are you managing from an identity standpoint. And I think we're going to see organizations move away from sort of the basic identity and access management and invest in more CNAP type programs, right? So the cloud native application platform um, protection programs where um, you get that entitlement management and the workload protection and your posture and cloud vulnerability um, and leverage the tools that are coming out into the market now. They've been in the market for a while. Um, um, that are enterprise grade and they give you sort of knowledge hubs of how other customers have built their programs and you can take that and leverage it and and sort of build your models after that, um, you know, some of the best practices. So that way you get the benefit of you're, you're right, kind of running in parallel where you've got you're managing your access in a more dynamic cloud posture as opposed to trying to take what you were doing on prem and duplicate that into the cloud. Um, while you're doing sim the same thing with your applications, rather than lifting and shifting and trying to duplicate what you were doing with your applications on-prem, you're also then refactoring them. And, and so running those kind of programs in parallel, I think is where as, as organizations evolve and mature, um, I think we're gonna start to see to see more of that as well um, in the environments. So David, your, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I'd like to take a slightly different angle on this one. I couldn't resist. And, you know, because like the panel has got to have a little friction, a little controversy. So I think another angle I like to think about is like, you know, looking at the uh, the long term that we're going to evolve over time is it's kind of like chipsets, right? Does everyone use only Intel chipsets? No, we have AMD, we have ARM. So the reality is over, over time, everybody is going to be multi-cloud, not single cloud, multi-cloud, right? And I think that some of the challenge that everyone needs to think about long term is that well, how do you have common policy? How do you have common access? How do you have common identity? How do you have common monitoring, right? Is that, can you have five different or two different, you know, different types of policies and monitoring and controls? No. And so I think this is an opportunity in the, the industry. I think it's an opportunity in, in the startup and innovation, but I think it's something everyone needs to think about is that you're not likely to be single cloud and single policy. And, and I think this is, uh, I think one of the realities of the long-term um, state of the industry. Totally agree. I think, um, you know, cloud brings a lot of interesting opportunities and challenges at the same time, right? There's the the benefits of agility, speed, agility, sorry, speed of deployment, ease of management, dynamic, you know, burstable workloads, ephemeral workloads that are on demand. Um, and there's a lot of advantages that come along from a security standpoint too. So what do we, you know, what do we think about the the specific advantages that that go along for the ride when you're moving to cloud? Yeah, certainly on in this area is that I'm, I I kind of have some strong opinions. So most companies and organizations are becoming global, right? What who can have twenty four by seven SOC and threat intelligence and incident response, hardware security experts, software experts, threat intelligence experts, all these, and especially if you're smaller size organizations um, uh, or businesses that. We need to be able to be global and twenty four by seven. And I think one of the major advantages of the cloud, right, is they have regional experts, they have 24 by seven experts, you know, all these things across the board. And I think this is one of the 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 reasons why you shouldn't remain only on premise, you know, anymore because of this distinct advantage. I I I, I agree with that. Um come Sun Life is a global organization and um you know all of our different regions are um at different levels of maturity. So um, you know, they're moving at different different speed and some um, have legacy type environments that they're trying to uh, work their way through and others are a bit more greenfield where they can take advantage of some of the more na native services. So it's trying to balance 
um, that across the organization while still having some consistency, because to your point earlier, um, that the consistency component of it allows you then to sort of make sure your, your controls are in place and you move faster. Um, I, I think the data security aspect of cloud is, while most people are nervous about putting their data in the cloud, I think that is, is one of the key benefits if, if you engineer your solutions properly. Um, you know, the best security solutions give you data security by design. And um, if you can have your security protocols and policies and access control and encryption um, and prevent you know, unwanted access um, to that confidential information. So while people are nervous about their data in the cloud, I think if you build it right, um, that's one of the key benefits of, of having your, your environment move to cloud. Yeah, to, to, to go back to one of the points that, that David made around the, the reduction in effort that you get from your workforce because you're leveraging all this expertise from these uh, um, these people who focus their entire jobs on managing infrastructure, managing security tools. They are experts in these spaces, which is very difficult for organizations, especially those who are not tech companies, uh, to focus on. You know, the cloud service providers, they, they come with a shared responsibility model, especially for those cloud native services. Um, historically, organizations have had to focus a lot of their, um, their energy on things like vulnerability scanning, patching, um, which are things that are very resource intensive. Uh, don't, these are things that does not bring a lot of value to the organizations uh, from, from the standpoint of the development teams. So it's a lot of times that a lot of time that these teams are spending uh, uh, focusing on the scans, looking at the results of those scans, patching their systems, testing after they patch. It, it takes a lot of cycles, right, to go through all of that. And, and I think with the cloud and using some of these cloud native services where they manage a lot of the infrastructure for you, it, it really increases that security game uh, because the cloud providers are responsible for doing that for you and they do it on a timely fashion. That's all they do in, in some of these cases, right? They have teams that are dedicated to ensuring that these systems are patched and that they're functioning as they're supposed to. Um, uh, so I, I really feel that's a huge one operational gain that organizations could, could benefit from and two brings a huge security advantage uh, to the organizations using these cloud native services. If I would just add, most organizations are not going to have the budget to spend what the cloud service providers can spend from a from a product development and from a security standpoint. So, I mean, that's a, a huge gain that you that you get from that shared responsibility model. So. Yeah, it, it, in reality, a lot of organizations just uh, don't do it well, right? It, it, it they they lag behind on the patching, they they slip on SLAs, and and it takes a long time, right, to to get these things right. Uh, so absolutely, Joanna. I love that point, uh, the sort of the inorganic staff augmentation effect, right, of having these things come out of the box that you can just enable and use. I think, you know, Joanna, I, one of the things that you said that I, that is, I think, from my perspective, one of the most important here is the security tooling and capability that is available out of the box, regardless of what pod security cloud service provider you're using. Uh, and obviously there's different levels of maturity in different areas that you'll see. But you know, all of these things come along with sort of this like double-edged sword um, consequence to them. Because the tool's great, but the tool's only as good as how you deploy it. So if I use like, you know, just as an example, identity and access management policy, right? Like you're building the right groups, you're building the right users, you're configuring MFA, like you're doing all the right things, or you think you are. And I think one of the things that that I've seen, and we've seen plenty of times where breaches, bad events happen because of a misconfiguration, not because the tool wasn't used, not because it wasn't implemented, because it was implemented or used improperly or in a non-comprehensive way or something was missed. And I think that's, for me, that's kind of part of the danger. It's the, the, the both the pro and the con of having amazing security capability just native out of the box from these providers is, um, you know, they kind of give you all the rope you need to hang yourself with, right? Like it, it's very easy to kind of allow yourself to lull, to be lulled into this like, 
false sense of security. We're like, oh, well, we've got IAM policy, so we're good. Oh, well, we've constructed the right VPC model and account tiering model, and we've got our security groups and our ACLs configured right. But again, those tools are only as effective as the manner in which they're deployed and configured and then monitored and updated and changed as the ecosystem changes. So the other, the other I think, huge pro, but also con, is the tools are amazing. But the tools, again, are only as good as you tune them to be. And part of that also means that you need to ma maintain close line of sight into how your environment is changing, because the paradigm that you've built from a security tooling perspective might necessarily change based on how the environment itself is changing. So I, I love all the capability and you know all the providers have invested tons of hours and dollars to build really, really robust capability. But it's ultimately in that you know, like you mentioned, I think that shared responsibility model of understanding, like, yes, they built that capability for me. Cool. I can go do the things. I can go secure the things, but I need to make sure I'm using those capabilities appropriately and effectively. Um, and I think the other, the other piece is, you know, not just line of sight on how your environment's changing, but also just regularly taking a hard look at the environment. Are the tools still effective, you know, whether it's red team, pen test, all, all those types of activities that you do to outside looking in at the the, the level of um, security that you've brought into the environment, making sure that you're just constantly assessing that and looking and making sure that making sure that the security tooling and the capability that you've baked in using these native offerings is doing the thing that you it's meeting the control objectives that you think it is. I think that's a that's a really big piece. So I'm going to dig in a little bit more, a little bit more specificity here. Um, what do we think about some strategies? Because obviously we've talked about, you know, data, data protection, whether data is at rest and transit. Um, what are some strategies that organizations can think about uh, and can take to encrypt uh, sensitive data in the cloud? Yeah. So, um, you know, going back to what we were just talking about around a lot of these security advantages in the cloud and the uh, native tooling that you get from a lot of these uh, cloud service providers, um, a, a lot of the cloud service providers now have very robust tooling, such as key management systems. They have HSMs in the cloud that you could you could very easily have um, uh, key lifecycle policies that you don't even have to worry about. Right, keys rotate on their own. These are things that traditionally have been very difficult for organizations to do to the point where co organizations shied away from using key management systems, and they they. They just try to do their best to to encrypt data uh, on disk, right? But today, with some of these cloud solutions, they just make it very easy uh, to do. Um, so, so one of the steps that organizations could take is leverage these services that the cloud providers uh, have, uh, leverage that tooling, encrypt the most sensitive data at the application layer, right? before that data ever leaves the workload where it, where it starts from, you know, encrypted at the application layer, leveraging a lot of this, this tooling and a lot of the uh, SDKs that have been built by these organizations that, that make it a breeze, right? You just import a library into your application that, that allows you to, to quickly grab the key that you need from the key management system and encrypt that data. Uh, uh, on the application before you ever store it, before you ever transmit it out of that system. I'd love to uh, kind of build upon that. Uh, maybe the, the next step I think is that of, uh, I agree with everything Asu says, is that also having, um, you bring your own key, right? Uh, having the management of the keys, right? And, and, and taking advantage of those, those key uh, automated systems, right? So that I think almost all the cloud providers have that, right? And you should be taking advantage of that, you know, for how data is stored and having control uh, and management of those keys. The other element is I think is important is, is the data is encrypted then, but who has access from there, right? And this is where you know, cloud providers have things like break glass or lock boxes and type of things is that you again have control of Sometimes they may need access to data for troubleshooting, debugging, or assistance, right? But again, you're giving the control. You understand how they're going to have access, when they're going to have access, and that, that's a big part of, of not just having the encryption, but who actually can have access to the keys to perform various functions. Agreed. I think I agree with both points. I think a big piece of this also is, um, and again, I, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back, right? Like when you're when you're getting ready to move data, in, whether it's data that's instantiated as part of a specific application, part of a consumer flow, or data that's moved from a reporting data store type of scenario, understanding what that looks like is, is I think, I think critical, right? To understanding what mechanisms you need to put into place to protect it. 
So understanding one, the type of data. I, I think someone mentioned earlier the concept of data sprawl, which is obviously a, a terrifying thing, but you need to have a line of sight onto what data is going where and under what circumstances. And if you know those things, you know what your data lineage is, you know what your data sprawl looks like, you know where, where your data lives and, and what it's doing and what applications are interacting with, moving it to different places, then you can sort of build a holistic view of, okay, it's going to land at rest at here. I need to make sure I'm using the right methodology around encrypting at rest, key rotation, key isolation, key meant all the operational rigor that goes around that sort of thing. If you're talking about data that's purely in transit being manipulated in memory, all of a sudden you're talking about encrypting on the wire, MTLS, and how do you manage those keys, those certificates. I think building that holistic view first, just understanding what data is going where is the critical piece. After that, it becomes, to your points, like it becomes like, hey, there's this tool that'll do this. Hey, you know what? I'm really going to do a BYOK scenario and bring my own. Hey, I'm going to do this other thing. Hey, I really need to build an intelligent mechanism for wrapping keys and data encryption keys. Like you can problem solve using available tools, whether they're you know native to the provider or SDKs that you get or other products you can get off the shelf. Um, but that problem solving starts with understanding you know, what is the problem statement itself first? Like what data is going to live where and is it going to stay there or is it going to move in some circumstances? Um, so I think that's, I think just kind of foundationally for me, a, a big piece of this is just really having the, the full data picture and what you're doing and, and under what circumstances it's, it's going into cloud, potentially exiting cloud and then within cloud environments, how it's being manipulated and interacted with. Yeah, I agree uh, with with all of the points that um, that everyone everyone has raised. You know, and like encrypting your data at rest and in transit, understanding where it's going and who's accessing it, um, your key rotation policies, um, establishing a council that looks at the policies on an ongoing basis and what's being flagged, and you know, building a bridge between your security teams and your operations teams um, in, in that council space to be able to kind of look at those things, and then adopting a least privilege access model. Um, at the beginning of your cloud journey, it's very difficult to take access away once people have had it. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at it from, you know, the, the lower environments, perhaps you get a bit more access, but once you get into your middle and, and, and production environments, um, going back to sort of that infrastructure as code approach uh, where everything is automated and, and people have only read access and no one is writing anything directly. It's everything is managed by, by your infrastructure as code or your automation policies and, Having a no um, no failure policy, you can't you can't go from one environment to the next. If your code fails, fix the code first. So all of those things, I think, um, play a. a it, it's not only the data itself, but the the components that you build around it um, in terms of protecting it from that standpoint. Totally agree. Um, so what are the? Is kind of a a big question. Um, what are the sort of the top two mistakes? Um, that each of us feels companies are are making or likely to make um, when you're running, moving applications, workloads up to up to a public cloud type environment from an on-prem environment. Well, the, you know, uh, Sean, I'd like to start is that if you're going to the cloud, you're planning to go to cloud, then you need to do equally consistently. You're going to plan your roles plan your access, you know, plan, plan your controls, right? So I know it's three things, not two things, but it's really how you planning these roles, the access and the controls you're going to have in place before it's implemented. Otherwise, the mistake is you are over-provisioned, right? You're over-entitled, and then it's very difficult to kind of correct that once you're in full production. Yeah. So Joanna, I'd love to hear what uh, you might uh, have uh, to think about that. That was actually my second one of my sec that was my second one. So I'll, I'll just top up with one. Um, I, I'm going to go more from an internal organizational culture perspective and making sure your organization is cloud ready. Um, organizations try to translate um, a, a mistake is trying to translate your on premise principles or practices or processes. The lift and shift of the applications that you talked earlier about, Sean, I think is part of that. Um, and and move them to cloud and behave the way that you did when you were on prem. I always use an analogy with my teams, just as if you're trying to learn a new language, it's very difficult to think in English and then translate it to French or Spanish or whatever language you're trying to learn. So you have to build that cloud fluency across your organization. Um, make sure that you're evolving your DevOps principles to be adapted for cloud and think in cloud as opposed to thinking on prem and then trying to translate that that up to cloud. Yeah, Joanna, you made a point earlier that it's impossible to take access away once people have it, especially in the cloud, 
right? I, I think one of the mistakes some organizations make when, when, when starting to migrate to the cloud is opening up the organization to use the cloud. And then that, that sprawl occurs, right? To, to reel that back in it is, is nearly impossible. So uh, once organizations start to, to feel like they're ready to make that journey to start mig migrating to the cloud, build that proper cloud governance into the model, right? Ensuring that the governance is there, there, there is a way to approve access to, to these environments before data starts going into them uh, so that we don't get stuck in this uh, situation where there is data that we don't expect to be in certain environments without the proper security controls. And, and, and the, the second point I, I would like to make uh, around some of the mistakes that are made is not designing resilience into the, the service that is being deployed to the cloud. Um, like so, some of the, the other panelists uh, mentioned, um, it, it's very different, right? The, the, the way that you manage and deploy services in a cloud environment is, is, is a really large departure from the way that you do it in an on-premise environment. So making sure that that resilience is designed into that application, that process, that system that you're deploying, I, I feel is something that, that will pay dividends in the end. Totally agree. I think the, the two mistakes, the first one that, I, that I've seen and heard about quite a bit is just the, the initial decision on what workloads to move to cloud. There's a lot of factors that go in, right? Like, and I know we've talked about upstream, downstream dependencies. We've talked about reg requirements and things you need to think about when you're talking about global, regional, multi-region deployments. Um, those decisions need to be really well thought through. Um, I've definitely seen and heard scenarios where uh, it's easy to identify a workload, identify an application, identify a, a flow of some kind and say, well, that's, that's our first target. We're going to move that to cloud. And then the more you dig into it, then where you dig into the nuance of how that application or flow works, all the dependencies, all the different ecosystem that goes around that has to support it, it becomes all of a sudden a, a non-trivial change to, to what you were planning originally. And all of a sudden the, the scope of what you're doing is radically different. Um, and so I think from just the first one that I see, it's, it's really at inception, which is around like the decision on what workloads to, to move up to there in the first place. Um, I think the other is assumptions. It's assumption based, right? Like we've talked a lot about native tooling, native capability, like just out of the box things that you can plug in and utilize, and and that uplift your ecosystem and your environment in in substantial ways. Um, but I think I've also, uh, you know, the danger there is it leads to also uh, assumptions that technical debt that is manifested over time in your on prem environments, architectural challenges, deficiencies. Uh, in just how things were designed and running on-prem will magically be fixed just because you're moving it to cloud, right? Like, oh, well, we've got this amazing ability to, to do infrastructure as code and, and dynamically burst workloads. And those things are wonderful and they're very powerful potentially. But if you're lifting and shifting, if you're moving a set of workloads, a, a flow, a set of systems from on-prem to cloud and those Fundamentally, those systems had flaws in them. They weren't performant. They weren't resilient. They weren't architected well. They're running on old, busted operating systems. Like those things are, are just coming along for the ride. And so, really, all you're doing is you're you're sort of just changing where the risk lives, rather than actually buying down any risk or getting any of the gains from moving into public cloud. I think that's a it's an easy pitfall to get into. Um, it's part of the. I know we've said it a few times on this forum so far. It's the one of the pitfalls of not not having clarity around what the shared responsibility model means. Like they're your workloads, they're your deployments, they're your systems, they're your applications. Like just because you're deploying in the cloud doesn't mean that the cloud service provider is suddenly going to just fix all the technical debt you've managed to accumulate over however many of, uh, of years you've been running. Um, I did want to take a, a second to thank David, Joanna, Jesus for, for joining us. I think this is a great forum, great conversation, really good points. Um, and also everyone who's tuning in, thank you for joining the Cloud Security Alliance's FinCloud Summit for 2024. I uh, hope it's been a, a useful and um, informative session for everyone.